thankfully it's not as hot as it was on Monday. I think it hit almost 100 some places in the Bay Area. Uh, just give a quickie nod. Here's your histogram, uh, how you did. And um, overall, we were quite pleased. We were hoping all the grades would be packed up in the 70s and 80s, but some folks struggled for different things. Um, basically, if you're in the 30s or 50s, come talk to us. Figure out why you're not in the 70s, because we, we wrote what we believe to be actually an easy exam. And just questions that were right down the middle, not a softball with the, not a spin on the curveball, just a nice softball, easy pitch. Uh, and the grading standards are published. Okay, so uh, the grading rubric should be published. If they're not, we can get the TAs to publish them. This week, if you have questions about your exam, I guess Luke and John Todd told you, just write, if you think you need some points back, you deserve some points back, just write an explanation, staple to your exam, return to us, and we'll try to get those points back to you. If those are. No curve. This is an absolute graded class. So there's, not, there's no competition. It's about helping each other. And it's not like, well, I have to beat my, my, my fellow students. Which means if you all get A's, we, we, that's OK. We would love you for it all. That's why I would say if you all get 80s, we're happy with that. That was the goal of the quest is to give you confidence. OK. So today, uh, I always do a tech news, news of the day. The tech news is that the CEO of NVIDIA recently had what they call a fireside chat where he sits down with some reporters and some other people in the industry and talks about things that he believes, kind of the state of the art industry. And he says, you ain't seen nothing yet. If you think it's amazing now, wait until, I think I showed you um, an example of using ray tracing on the cloud last time I spoke. And I showed a picture of this beautiful shadows being done by having a game in which a whole room, maybe a whole warehouse of machines were contributing to the frame rate of a game I was playing. It was an online game, like Google Docs, but it was a game rather than kind of a single application. And he says, boy, if you think that you have an amazing experience now, imagine the world in which a whole, so right now, the service in the cloud means like Google Docs and some other stuff, which is just like Word in your own machine, right? Word machine, you can do it, text editing, spreadsheets, Google Docs, same thing. But imagine when you have access, the price comes down for supercomputers, meaning a whole cluster of computers, a whole warehouse full. So getting access to that power is cheap, and that you have access to applications that you could never run on your PC. It's 40,000 times as powerful as your PC, but accessible just like Google Docs is for you. Incredible, right? That's what he says is going to happen. So we're really excited about the future. Yes? Sure, sure. There's a lot of streaming media, yeah. Wow, it's very interesting. There's a talk right after this. I'll give you guys an insider tip. I'll even maybe try to end early so we can all walk over. There's a talk right now talking about digital. John Paul Jacob, the Citrus Research Exchange talk uh, at 300 Citrus Auditorium, 300 Citrus Hard to Die. So right, right above your lab in the main auditorium. Um, there's a talk about digital media and how it's all coming together. So essentially, things are merging together. If you ask me for that, film, television, internet, computers, it's all putting together into one thing. And all these companies are trying to put a, you know, put a box there that'll kind of make it all happen. For a long time, people try to do that. It's interesting. It's, we'll talk more about that, but it's an interesting thing. And this talk, we'll talk, this talk will kind of get into that a little bit. Happy Confucius Day. I'm wearing my Chinese shirt I bought in China. And it's Confucius Day, which is also known as Teacher's Day. You're supposed to bring your teacher a flower. So I gave my, my son, kindergarten son, a flower to give to his teacher. So that was the thing. So <clears throat> I have a little flower, virtual flower box here for you to give virtual flowers. Um, here are two great quotes that Confucius has been known to say, which I think are very relevant to this class. Um, one is, knowledge is recognizing what you know and what you don't. Um, I think that's really, really very astute, that it is understanding that um, they say a little knowledge is dangerous. And a little knowledge is dangerous because you think you have it all, but you really don't. For example, oh, you, you, you're learning to drive a car, and you, you do for one day, say, oh, I can drive a car. But you really can't, and now you get on a highway, and then you have an accident because you really don't know how to drive a car well in all the situations. Uh, and here's something in terms of learning styles. Uh, how do you learn best? You might want to ask yourself. Um, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. And I do and I understand. So that's what we believe as well. And that's why we're having this lab-centric course that has you do things, and that's hopefully working for all of you. So 10 miles up, concurrency. Concurrency 
is an idea that things happen concurrently, in parallel. Okay, that's the basics of it. And there are two ways of dividing up the world. You either have the world of intramachine parallelism, which means within one computer, everybody kind of touch their computer nearby them, that's their nearby computer. Within that computer, many different kind of workers are working together to kind of solve some task. Then you have intermachine parallelism, which is this computer in conjunction with that computer and his computer and that computer all work together. That's intermachine parallelism. Okay? Intermachine parallelism we're going to save until week 12. Talk about systems and how Pixar uses a whole room full of stuff and how when you go online to do a search, Google fires up 20,000 machines to, to, you know, to, to handle your request. All that's going to happen. Uh, by the way, there are handouts. I'm sorry for that. Luke is bringing them, and I guess there must have been a delay. But so, so don't worry about taking notes. All these are going to be a note. So please put your pens down and enjoy. Uh, unless you see something that I'm, that, that's, I'm saying that's not on these notes, in which case you should do it. But in general, every single lecture, we're going to strive to have handouts for you. So I'm sorry if we haven't done that as much as we, that we, we promised to. But every lecture, we, we are going to endeavor to have lecture notes for you before class. Great. Uh, so intracomputer is within one computer. So that means multiple cores. I've said that word before, but today we're really going to define it. Multiple cores, meaning your CPU, your processor, has different workers. We call them cores, and they're all working together to make something happen. And that's today's lecture. So there's also, by the way, GPU, the graphics processing unit, your graphics card, also has an amazing amount of parallelism. And we don't talk about that here. That's very, very valuable and very interesting, but that's not what kind of what we're talking about. We're talking today about multi-core and how to do that. And on the right, it's also called distributed computing. So five parts of any computer. This is the computer I mentioned before, and here are the five parts. And I've, I've even gone as far as to suggest that if you want, you can tattoo this. Yeah, I would use a henna, not a full in, in the body thing. But I would go with a henna tattoo of this. This is it. This is the five pieces of computer. Jean von, Jean, 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 no. John von Neumann uh, is credited at, with this architecture. That's, he's a very important person in computer history. This is the von Neumann architecture, five parts. A processor on your left, which has what we call control and data path. Data path is like all the roads, okay? all the roads that get data from one part of the system to the other. Control is like the traffic lights that sell the traffic. OK, now I'm transferring data from memory to the arithmetic logic unit to do some addition. So I'll turn the traffic lights so data flows that way. And then control would say, OK, after that's done, the, mem the data has to go back into memory. So I have to turn the traffic lights, and so the data flows back into memory. That's control. OK, very easy. That's all you need to know. Control and data path. Data path is the wires. The path control is kind of the hands of that, the, the marionette part of that. Memory is where things are stored temporarily. Memory also reflects a memory hierarchy. There is a memory hierarchy. Disks are part of memory. They're just lower in the memory hierarchy. And you have normal memory. You know, I'm going to buy some RAM at Best Buy. That's what we usually mean by memory. But you also have smaller copies of memory that are kind of allow the processor to be much faster. And those are called caches. I didn't write that. You might want to write that down. Caches. C-A-C-C-A-C-H-E. And on the right, you have devices, the way the computer talks to other things. And that's input and output, or I.O. If it weren't for I.O., the computer would just spin and hum and use the power. wouldn't be able to talk to anything. This display is I.O. My keyboard is part of I.O. Right? A speaker or a microphone is part of I.O. If it didn't have any I.O., your computer would do nothing but use power and be boring. Okay? So that's how it talks to the world. All right? Clickers. Get your clickers ready. Here we go. By the way, I don't know why we've lost so many students. We have 80 registered. And today, maybe they're at the beach. It is a very hot day. OK, here we go. Clickers ready, at the ready, go. What causes the most headaches for SW software and HW is hardware designers with multi-core computing? What causes the most headaches with multi-core computing? Control, data path, memory, input or output. So we're talking about parallelism. We're talking about this machine with lots of cores in it. And if you're designing stuff in hardware or you're writing software, what's, what is just the thing that causes the most trouble? Okay? Remember, you may have never heard of these five words before, so this is kind of your best guess in a sense. Okay? 41, let's see if we can get to 50. Remember, this is out of 80 students who took the midterm. So let's, let's crank it up. 50, 50, squeeze it, squeeze it. 49, all right, well, we'll stop there. OK, so let's just see what you said. Look at that. Interesting, OK? 
So the answer is C, memory. We're going to see why that's critical, but memory is really the thing that causes the main headaches. And it's because you've got one set of memory, and you have multiple people trying to read and write that, and how do you keep track of the version and people don't clobber it, all that stuff. So it's about managing this shared resource of memory, which, which caused a lot of trouble. I'll talk more about the details of that, but yes. The hard drive does fall into memory. It's one of the lower tiers of the memory hierarchy. That's exactly right. Memory hierarchy, little triangle. Okay. All right. So keep on going. Let's, we have a bit to get through. So what's inside of a processor? You notice I'm kind of like revealing, uh, going deeper and deeper. So here is a processor. That top is, what, what was, what's a key word? That top is something of a processor. It's an blank of a processor. Louder. It's an abstraction of a processor. The processor actually has wires and transistors and heat sinks and all that. Well, heat sinks something else, but it's a more complicated thing. And that's just a simple abstraction. Beautiful. Exactly right. Well done. Uh, so here's some facts about a processor. It's kind of neat. Um, primarily made of silicon. Um, there's hundreds, hundreds to thousands of millions of transistors. That's a, the, the bullet point in green. Um, there's the ratio of size. There's something called feature size on a processor, which is how close two wires are, kind of how two transistors. How close can you get these guys? And you want to make feature size really small. How small are they up to now? 45 nanometers. That's incredibly small. The size of human hair is in the micrometer. I think it's in the micrometers. Okay. And maybe more, maybe much more than that. So that's incredible small, incredibly small. And they're getting down to 32. They now have the new Intel processors, some of them are actually in 32, and they're going down to 22 and 16. That's the roadmap. They call that their feature size roadmap. So how small these things are getting. It's ridiculous how small things are getting. Um, they have conducting layers, so layers of conducting material. Uh, and CMOS is what this is made out of. So CMOS is just the kind of technology that they use to make this. You have this, this, this processor, really valuable, very expensive, very hot. You then have to solder it onto a package. You connect it to a package so that you have spreading of the chip level signals, so all these little teeny signals to something that is board level. Because that package is going to go, these are much more, these wires are much more sturdy than the high density of wires here that have a little gold connectivity to that. Okay. So that package is now, and but the, the, another really important part is heat dissipation. That thing is going to get ridiculously hot. We'll talk about how hot it actually gets. But you have this to help with the heat dissipation, because that can then radiate out. And usually there's a, a huge heat sink with these really cool fans and foils and and, 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 and uh, to allow cooling of this incredibly hot device when you're actually running full, full scale. Any questions? Sure, sure. Uh, it doesn't get so hot to melt it. No, but it gets really, I'll show you how hot it gets. We'll, we'll show a, a heat graph, but it doesn't get hot enough to melt it, thankfully. If it did, we'd be in trouble. It might melt plastic. I mean, it gets hot enough to melt plastic, not metal, though. Uh, this is one of the most important laws it's kind of a prediction, it was, uh, from a Cal graduate. Check this out. So this is Gordon Moore, who was the Intel co-founder, got his bachelor's in 1950. And he predicted doubling of transistors every two years. And let's, let's look to see how well, how, well, how well he did. 1971, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2008, and it does. That's the line that's doubling. And look how close everything that's come out has been that. And it actually, he believed that initially it was a belief in, here's my prediction, and it became a roadmap the industry used. So kind of, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a uh, coincidence that the lines run along the dot, because they said, well, we have to be at this date, we have to be at this point, and so let's <laughs> hurry up and work on our team so that we hit that mark. So it really isn't so much a prediction as it is kind of a roadmap that was used. And Luke has some handouts, so we're going to go and <coughs> hand out to the, to the team. Yes. OK. Go ahead. Yes, it became a self fulfilling He actually says himself. It's more of a self-fulfilling prophecy than a, than a prediction. OK, so clickers at the ready. And we'll do the clickers as Luke is doing the handouts with maybe some help from other folks. And what is this curve? Jonathan talked about different algorithmic uh, categories. Okay. Constant, linear, quadratic, 
cubic and exponential. And keep in mind what the axes are, OK? So let's start this one. Ready? Go. How'd that move? Did I just click start? Start. OK. There's my, there's my key 49 number. All right. 50. You had 50. Great. And let's see how you did. Uh, talk to your neighbor. Have, have a second. Let, let's have some interactivity. Talk to your neighbor and tell them what you said and why. And, and come into a consensus. So go talk to your neighbors. And if you're in five, if you're in a five row, make a group of three. But make sure you talk to your neighbors. OK? So let's re-graph. I, I have your first results here. Let's re-vote. Go. Let me see what the cause of that sound is. I know it's painful, but it's really loud. If, if, if it stops, we'll uh, open the door again. OK? 46, 47, come on, 48, 49, 50, and 50. Yoink. All right, display. All right, so this was, that's your second guess, and that's your first guess. Look at that. Interesting. And as many of you can guess, the right answer is exponential. This is an exponential growth. Every year, you double. That's like 2 to this power of something, right? You started 2, 4, 8, 16. That's an exponential growth, because you're doubling every time. OK? That's kind of cool. And amazing that, whoops, that we've been able to keep at that rate so long. It's incredible. We have exponential growth in not just doubling transistors every year, but actually, next slide. Related curves to Moore's law. So by the way, Moore's law is only transistors on a chip. So they say, oh yeah, Moore's law is this capacity of a hard drive. It's not. It's also exponential, but it's not Moore's law. Moore's law is only transistors on a chip, right? Okay. But here are some related curves. Also, on, an, on a linear exponential graph, right? This is, a, this is a log plot here, linear plot. That means an expo, a straight line is an exponential curve, okay? So this is a log plot on the on the vertical axis. Look at this. Let's actually look at some of these key things. Transistors, so the top one you've seen is transistors in thousands. And you see that's the, that's what's really cool is all the data points for the transistors is listed there. That's kind of neat. I also see here that I have frequency, which has gone up also exponentially, but on a slower rate, a little bit slower rate. Okay. Typical power, look at power and how much power we're using for a CPU, just the, just the CPU, not even for the whole computer, just the CPU, not powering the display or the keyboard, just the CPU. And then here is performance. And it says single thread performance. And we say, what is a thread? A thread is, we'll talk about it in two slides, but single thread means that the program doesn't split. It just kind of is one linear path of flow. It doesn't kind of split and have other helpers to work on it. It's just one single linear path of flow. Okay? Basically, if it had one core, a single thread would work on that one core and keep that core fully optimized. If you had multiple cores, then a single thread would only use one of those cores because it's only, it, does, it does split in a way. Okay? So here's what we got. Look what happens around this time here. Something happens. Something significant happens that hasn't happened in 30 years. Let's look at it again. 75 to 2005. That's 30 years where you're beautiful until something happens. And what happens? Yeah.
Uh, it's not the speed. That, that's, that's a good, good guess in terms of the speed being too much to keep up with. It's not the speed of the issue, yeah? Roberto. Oh, uh, that's lithography, and that's talking about how, how to make the circuits. And in fact, that hasn't changed. That, that's, I mean, that, that's evolved, but that's not the reason. That's evolved to different things. Oh, no, it's, it's related, and it gets smaller. Things are getting smaller and smaller, and you have to go to different ways to actually lay out the chips. So that would be the inflection. Oh, I'm sorry. True. Right, right. So things run hot. I hear things run hot, and that's the key thing. Things have run too hot. Okay, We couldn't cool the chips. The chips are getting, this typical power is the key link. We can't cool the chips anymore. So if we can't cool them, we have to do something to keep them under the range of what we can cool. How do you keep getting performance improvements? Well, you've gone flat in a single thread performance. So the only way you can do it is by having not single threads, but multiple threads. And that's where you have to have, if you have multiple threads, that means that's the ability you have to have multiple workers to handle those multiple threads. If I take a problem divided into 10 pieces, it makes sense to have 10 workers to help me with those 10 pieces. So here's the next slide. Number of cores and the parallel application performance. Notice that keeps going up. And that's the critical thing. If you consider applications now in parallel, like if I do it in code of video, that can be divided up in different sections. Of you know, an hour of video, I can have one core work on the first 10 minutes, one core work on the next 10 minutes, or even within a frame. One core works on the top part, one core works in the middle part. You can divide it in really a lot of clever ways. Number of cores has gone up, and that's the key thing. Okay? We have handouts? Okay, let's get those started around so people have this, so you'll be able to make notes on this. Here we go. Around 2000 there was a power curve. Power density prediction is the power density prediction. 1970 to 2000. And here's what happened. Bloggedy, 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 up and down, up and down, up and down, until the P6. And they saw there was a curve here that was continuing up. I think the, I think the P6 is either this one or that one. And they said, oh my gosh, if this continues, we will get to power density, meaning like how hot is it per unit millimeter, say. Okay? How, how much power is there? How hot is it per unit millimeter and per unit area? Look at it. We've already passed a hot plate. Imagine a hot plate. You know, you boil your ramen noodles on it. We've already passed a hot plate, meaning if you could take your CPU and scale it to be this big, you could put something on it and it would boil water and cook you some ramen. Isn't that crazy? And look what the numbers, look what we're approaching. A nuclear reactor, a nuclear reactor you're going to be approaching next in 2010. And then, oh, I don't know, a rocket nozzle. And then a little bit farther up is the sun's surface. Do you appreciate this? How hot these things were getting. And they said, we can't do this anymore. So that's the reason that re when the Core 2 CPU came out, the Core 2 Duo, the Core 2, remember Intel's big Core 2? You may remember. When that came out, it was the first time that they had actually dropped. So they had a couple of other guys, and they dropped back down. The core two didn't hit nuclear reactor, and they dropped down. And now we've kind of leveled off in this reasonable to cool range, okay? Because we can't keep going in that crazy uh, path off the edge of, of the cliff in terms of trying to cool these things. So here's the important thing you take away from the last, all the kind of slides up to here. When you go multi-core, when you go and transfer into, rather than a single core, multiple cores, it allows you to do the following. Here's an important thing. The power of an integrated circuit, of a CMOS integrated circuit, is proportional to C V squared F. Like, Dan, what? This is not physics. What are you talking about? Well, let me tell you what these mean. C is capacitance, how much something can hold a charge. It's related to the area of it. V is the voltage. So V squared, you still want to reduce the voltage as much as you can. But there's a limit. There's a physical limit. And the frequency, how fast you run it. So it feels like if, if this is getting too hot, you can do, reduce any one of those three things. But capacitance is kind of the property of the device plus the area. The larger thing has a higher capacitance. So that, if you can make a smaller area, you can win on the capacitance. Voltage, you really can't change. Oh, maybe you can change it a little bit. Frequency, you can certainly change. So look what they've done. 
Here's a single thing in the same process technology, meaning, say, 45 nanometers. You now know what that means. That's how thin those two lines are. In that same process, by the way, when I say process, it means a huge billion dollar manufacturing plant that's going to create chips in which every wire is about 45 nanometers apart. That's what that means. A huge facility to make that. When I say it's a process, it means you devoted this huge fabrication, they're called fab plants. And, this, and they'll have a big label. This is a 45 nanometer fab plant. It means everything comes out of that 45 nanometers. And then maybe another pain plant would be a 20, what's the next one, 32 nanometer fab plant. Okay. So in the same process technology, here is a core and a cache. A cache is part of the memory hierarchy. You've got memory, and a cache is like a local copy that the processor uses to kind of speed up things, because it's on the chip. It's actually on the chip. You know the thing that's hot that I talked about before? That chip has processing stuff, and that's we call that the core. And it has a cache, or a local copy of memory, because it's really close to the chip and fast, really small and fast. But look at this. If I double that, now I double it, and I double the size of the cache, and I have two distinct cores, two distinct worker units, then what do I get? Well, I can reduce the voltage by a little bit. I can reduce the frequency. Perhaps the capacitance changes a bit. And the power stays at 1. Let's, you know, that's like, this is normalized to this number, right? The power stays at 1. Because I've lowered the voltage and frequency, but I've increased the area, they all factor in. So that power means that you stay at 1. Wait, so that's cool. Same power, same power. How's my performance? <gasps> 1.8. That's incredible. That means that if I keep doing this, I can keep the same power line and continue to increase my performance. Does that make sense? That's really cool. So that's what they've done. That's exactly what they've done using exactly this picture. By the way, Activity lap monitor, let me pass for a second. Activity monitor is something that you should bring up on your Macs in lab. An activity monitor, see right there? Look, I have two cores on this laptop. And that tells me how my cores are doing. And they're pretty idle now, because I'm just using a slideshow. But if I were to run a really hard program, it would go and it would they both pin to the right. And I encourage you to bring this up and just kind of watch what's happening to the, oh, I don't know, Eight cores in the Macintosh lab. Uh, is it the eight? Is it? OK, it's good. OK. So eight's good, better than two. And you can view all eight cores in eight different kind of windows like that. That's really cool. So I encourage you to bring up Activity Monitor and play with that on the Mac lab to see what happens as you do your stuff in lab. So let's talk about considerations, right? We're talking about, so I'm giving you, I'm summarizing a lot of lectures into kind of one really essence, the essence of concurrency here. And it is hot. And it's loud. Should we try to open the door and see what we do with the sound? Yes. Should we, can we do that one? And it's getting too hot for me, too. But the sound is so loud. Listen. It's, it's actually got quieter. Maybe, maybe we'll live with that. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, here's a picture of different machines, from a handheld to a high power workstation to a whole server farm. I mean, that's a big cluster right there that you'd have in a, in a rack in the basement. Okay. Power. What's what's the unit of power? Everybody know physics? What's the unit of power? Watts. What's the, at power is, is something per second. Energy per second. What's energy? Joules per second, right? So that could be joules per operation times operations per second. You can, you know I can just make anything. It can be joules per elephants times elephants per second. They cancel out. It's still Right, joule energy per second. But operation is like doing something. And the nice thing is, operation per second is the clock frequency. It's how fast the heartbeat of the system is. Like, one gigahertz is a billion times a second. It means it goes up and down a billion times a second. It's a square wave, but it goes up and down a billion times a second. Okay? So, look at this. Here's what's really cool. I can now graph, because I have a product of two things, if I hold power fixed and power is constant, then I look at the graph of those two factors, energy per operation in the vertical axis, operations per second on the horizontal axis. And what you get is, for a fixed power, there's this 1 over x kind of shape curve. Do you remember 1 over, x, 1 over x curve that you're seeing here? For a fixed power, I have this curve of, I can ride anywhere along this curve, and that's still satisfying my fixed power. Okay? So you have different power constraints for different devices. Handhelds have a much lower power constraint. Big workstations may not have any high end, but may, may, you may have you know, energy star and you have to get things within, let's say, 100 watts. 
You might only have one watt for a handheld. Now, let's think about here. What are some of the things that come into it? What are some of the factors? Well, thinking about power, well, that means power is going to affect how I package it, because I have to dissipate that power. Cooling is, again, part of the dissipation of heat. System noise, if I have a fan, how noisy things are. Um, case temperature, how hot. My, actually, my phone gets actually hot. You feel my phone is actually getting hot, because I've, I've turned it on right now to show me a little clock. And I've turned, I've turned the, I know, the sleep off. So it's been on the last 40 minutes, and it's actually getting pretty hot. Okay, so that's a consideration. And then you have air conditioning. You have this big rack of, rack of servers. You have to deal with HVAC or heating. Uh, what's the V for it? A heating and HVAC? I don't know what that V stands for. But AC for air conditioning. Heating something and air conditioning. I don't know what the V stands for. Ventilation. Heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Thank you. And then energy, you have issues like battery life, the bill, and the, the mobile device, and the weight. Okay? So it's kind of cool that if, if I, watch this, if I can reduce my energy preparation, make my, my chip more efficient somehow, then I can make it faster. Because I can, for the same power, do more, increase the performance. Isn't that interesting? But if the cost for doing something is really high in terms of the heat energy preparation, I better crank down my clock to keep within that one watt constraint. So I have to ride that somehow. And if I can get that down on the, on the left side, if I can get this down, then I can walk farther out and get higher performance. So it actually makes sense to spend a lot of time thinking about how much energy per operation, which is kind of a weird way to think about it, but you can if you break it like that. So now, you're going to say, but Dan, look, I had a dad who was in grad school, and they did parallel programming in grad school 30 years ago. What's different this time? Well, you saw what was different this time. That curve flattens out. Three or four slides ago, there's a curve that flattens out. We've gone multi-core for the first time ever in 2005-ish. So here's the phrase. And I'll read it to you if you can't read it from the back. This shift toward increasing parallelism is not a triumphant stride forward based on breakthroughs in novel software and architecture for parallelism. Instead, this plunge into parallelism is actually a retreat from, either, from, from even greater challenges that thwart efficient silicon implementation of traditional uniprocessor architectures. So it says, we tried to keep squeezing juice from the lemon of the uniprocessor, you know, not single core, fast thing, just turn the clock rate up, and we can't do it. We can't do it. So it's a retreat. It's like we've given up, isn't it interesting, and gone parallel because we have no other way to get over the hill, to keep giving performance increases to our users in a uniprocessor domain. We have to go multi-core, multi-processor. Okay? Kind of cool. So now let's talk about some software parts of it. You're writing a program, and the program has a single, what we call thread, this, a single thread that says, I'm just a single guy running on a single core, and do this. Oh, if this, then go over here. OK, call that subroutine. Come back. Do all these things. It's a single thread. At no point have you ever explicitly said to your program, hey, split up. I have a list of 10 things. Split up, and 10, 10 workers attack each one of the elements of my list, and then come back. And then when you're all done, we'll do something out of that. OK? That's what the idea of threads is. The idea of threads is a thread of execution, a single stream of instructions as you navigate your way through your path, okay? through an if loop, through a function call, single thread. Okay? A program can explicitly, what we call in our computer science word, fork itself. Bloop, and now it's two. And both of them are going to compute something. And then there'll be a join that allows us to merge later. Okay? So I'm going to fork or split into multiple threads. Those can be handled by multiple cores, right, the helper units. And then at some point, I'll join later, and we'll all keep walking forward. And that will allow me to have parallelism. And that's really cool. That's called multi-threading. Okay? So a single CPU, a single CPU, if my laptop had been a single core, not two. You saw the two, two, two okay, VU meters. But it, had it been one, a multi-threaded program could still work. And here's how it works. Five threads want to be run. Five things need to be done. For example, there's somebody playing a movie in the background. And there's Microsoft Word running. And Firefox is downloading a video. And YouTube is over here doing something. And somebody's uh, playing a game. Well, you all know that you've been able to run multiple programs at once right? on your laptops. Your laptops may be old enough to be Single core. Well, how did it do it? Well, it did this. Time division multiplexing. Ready? Uh, who were you again? You were the game? No, you were not the game. You were the 
Movie. Okay. Okay, ready? Movie. Okay, you got like a millisecond. Okay? Play some frames. Okay, done. You're asleep. Okay? Microsoft Word. You got some stuff. Okay, great. Firefox. Do some downloading. Great. Uh, YouTube. Play some movie. Okay, great. See, when you have things that are kind of playing movies, that's a problem because you can drop frames if you don't get enough time in the time division multiplexing. If I added more and more things to run in this time division multiplexing, you'd see your movies start to skip because they couldn't keep up with the data rate. They're not, they're just with one CPU and one core, you don't have enough time in the time division multiplexing to like not drop a frame. So you'll see audio starts to sputter, video sputters. You've ever seen that before? I've seen it. Okay. That's part of the problem when you have this. Multi-threading says, yes, I am Dividing my problem into multiple threads, and I have a computer that has multiple cores to handle those threads so that it kind of matches up nicely. Right? If I had five cores, but I think all five of you can run at once, and you're all happy. Nobody has to kind of sleep. Does that make sense? It's kind of cool. So this is a really big slide. You're going to say, well, Dan, if I could split my problem n different ways, and I had n different cores, wouldn't I be n times faster? Right? Let's say I had 100 cores, and I had a problem that had 100 different pieces. Well, doesn't that mean I would be exactly 100 times faster? Rather than taking 100 seconds, I take one second, in theory, right? That's the perfect world. 100 cores helping with a problem that has 100 threads. And it, initially, with one thread, it took me 100 seconds. Well, they all should be able to run all together in one second, in theory. Amdahl's law is a limit. And it says, every program you write is going to have a parallel portion that you can split and a serial portion. It means you can't split. It has to be run on one core. It can't be split up. Okay? So every program has some ratio of that, some ratio of that. A parallel portion, a serial portion. Not too hard. Okay? The parallel portion can get split up, and that can be really fast. But the serial cannot. That we call in computing is a bottleneck. You are bottlenecked, you're stuck by that serial portion. Okay? So let's look at it. Amdahl's law. S is a serial fraction of the program. Okay? It's a fraction, number from 0 to 1, that says how serial your program is. If it's 0, then it's all parallel. If it's 1, that means it's all serial. Okay? P is the number of cores. It used to be the number of processors, because you used to have different processors, literally two different processors. Now we have one processor with multiple cores. My, the machine in the lab, by the way, is two processors with four cores each, just to, just to give it, if, if you wanted to cure it. It's not actually eight different cores on one CPU. It's actually two CPUs with four cores each, kind of neat. And the new machines come out and have six cores on two, six cores each, and you can put two of them in there for 12. Uh, so here we go. Speed up. The speed up as a function of the number of processors, okay, Whenever you say speed up of something, it's the time, it's the old time divided by the new time. Okay? The time of one processor divided by the time it takes for P processors. So the speed up is time for one over time for P. Kind of makes sense, right? And what's the speed up? Well, time for one, we'll just call it one. The time for P is, well, I've got some fraction that's serialized, I can't divide into pieces, and a fraction that's not serialized, which is here, I'm, I might even zoom in to make it easy for you to see. The time that's not serialized, which is the parallel part, which is 1 minus s. That's the parallel part. And you're going to divide that by p, because that parallel stuff you're going to divide by your p processors. So the 1 minus s, or the parallel part of your code, is going to be divided by how many processors you have. Well, as p goes to infinity, as I allow you to have an infinite number of processors, what's the asymptotic behavior of that? Okay. Well. What happens when you have something, a, a number in the bottom that goes to infinity? What happens to that term? Goes to zero, right? So that whole parallel part goes away. We'll just consider that a constant time. Bam, free, you get it for free. Yielding 1 over s. So your speed up that you get is not, I don't get 10 times faster. Oh, I have a program. I have 10 cores. I'm going to be 10 times faster. Oh, yeah? Well, that's if. You have no serial portion. If there's no serial portion, yes. And in theory, in perfect world, you're 10 times faster with 10 cores. You divide it up 10 pieces, you're 10 times faster. But really, the ratio is li limited by 1 over s. p isn't even a function here, because p goes to infinity. So that's really interesting. So the performance is limited by the serial portion, if you ever have code. Or you say, well, Dan, 
even if it were all parallel, could you get that infinite speed up? If I had infinite processors, could you get infinite speed up? No. Here are the issues. Look at this. This is just a small share of all the problems there are for me to divide up a problem into a parallel workers. For example, in lab, you're going to have this fun project of shuffling cards and then sorting them again, like putting them back in the original order. And how fast can you do it? And if you break the record, you could get fame and fortune. If you, as one person, can put a shuffle deck back in order again, less than, I think the record is now 30 seconds or something. If you can do that, a whole deck of cards less than 30 seconds, you, you'll be on the front cover of the of San Francisco Examiner, I promise you. Because that's a big deal. That's a really big competition. Every year it's held. And if you think that you have a cool, fast way of doing that, then that's, you can get some fame and fortune. But the interesting thing for me is, what if I let you have the whole class work on it? So your job, we're going to do this in lab, every of the three classes, the three labs, are going to compete to see how fast your class can sort a deck of cards. We're going to shuffle it, fully shuffled, randomized. We're going to put it on a table. Luke and John are going to have timers. And, we, and you guys get to discuss what is the algorithm for, sh for putting them back together efficiently so that you, make it, you can make use of all the people in your room or so that you can do it as fast as you can, given everybody you can as helpers. You don't have to use everybody, but think about how fast you can ever do that. Here is some problem. Okay? So to do that, what, are you, what cost are you paying? Okay? You are, compared to you doing it by yourself, right? you shuffling it by yourself and resorting it by yourself, it is the time to think about how to divide the problem up. You might have, it might, there might be some computation involved in how you divide up efficiently. So that's time to think about dividing up. Time to hand out the work units. Maybe you hand a small cluster of cards to a certain person. I don't know how you do that. But that, there's the time to hand it out. That's part of the factor. All the workers may not be equally fast. One person might say, oops, and then the glasses fall off. And now the cards are here. And, I, and this is me. It's like Woody Allen. Where is the cards? Where are the cards? And all of a sudden, you can't even see the cards. So that worker, me, is much slower than the other workers. And now you're waiting for this slow worker to do it because my glasses fell off. Some workers may fail. I may lose a card. I may spill coffee and up, oh, and it goes in the garbage and up, oh, it's down the drain. You've lost my cards. You can't. You hold up. How do you deal with that? It's real. I hand data to you. This data is from SETI, and SETI at home is you know measuring, listening to the skies for extraterrestrials. I hand data to you, and your machine crashes and takes that data with it. Like the whole hard drive crashes, it's gone. SETI better keep copies, or better do some redundancy to be able to handle that. There may be contention for, contention for shared resources. Maybe each of you grab the pen and write what cards you have. Well, there's only one pen, and you're all kind of grab, trying to grab the pen to write your cards you have on the board. That's a shared resource. You could be overwriting each other's answers. If you and I are both doing, we'll see this a little later when we talk about race conditions. You and I are both doing some computations and writing our answer on the board. I might actually overwrite your answer, and your answer might be lost in that process. Um, this happens, by the way, if you ever do this, if you ever take a, the task of co-authoring a paper, and you say, well, let's just email around what the current version is. And I email it to you, and then you make some changes, and then I email it to Bob, and Bob makes some changes, and then both of you had what we call write lock. Both of you were making edits to my original draft. And then you come in, and then I say, well, can I take yours? That's the new draft. And then you give me, oh, God, this is the new draft. And I'll overwrite your draft with this one, and all the changes you made are gone, because you both were making co changes to two copies. So that you kind of had a shared resource, and you're both overwriting that. You might have to wait till the last worker returns. You might actually need all the cards. In the case where I dropped my glasses, you might actually need that. So you're waiting for me to do that as a slow worker. And then you have to put the data back together, which is perfect, right? Cards have to eventually be back together as a sorted pile. So all of that's relevant to your problem and to almost all parallel problems. All these things prevent Amdahl's law from even getting to 1 over s, because you have all these issues of the parallel part not being perfectly parallelizable because of this. So quickie, quickie. Query. This C change to multi-core parallelism means that the computing community, me, you in the future, if you join the computing community, has to rethink which of the following: languages, architectures, algorithms, data structures, or all of the above. Go. Let's do a fast one. See how fast I can get to 49. All right. That was an easy one. The answer is all the above. We have to rethink everything. Everything changes when you go parallel, when you go multi-core. And that's exciting. Look at that. Make new languages, new parallel languages, new parallel architectures. All that stuff is relevant. Really cool. But parallel programming is hard. You're saying, but Dan, 
you know, this programming stuff is nice, but programming is hard. What do you mean hard? Look at this. Here's a piece of code. Withdraw amount. If balance is greater than amount, set balance to balance minus amount. And report true as a successful withdrawal, like an ATM. Otherwise, report false. You try to take out too much money. I don't, I don't touch your balance, right? OK? So now, two people will call and withdraw at the same time. I have, how much do I save? I have $100 in the bank. And I have my wife and I both decide to use our credit card and ATM at the same time. Ready? Ching, ching, $75. What could happen if two people were running this at the same time? <laughs> The behavior you want is one of us succeeds, one of us doesn't, right? Only 100 bucks. We can't both take out 75. So you want a good behavior. But what could happen in a worst case for Bank of America? Good, 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 good. They both come in at the same time. So both come in. Two people run it, right? The program runs tw twice. Both do the check. Amount is 75, balance is 100, right? They both, in parallel, pass the case. Is balance 100 bigger than 75? Yes. So both of us go into the inner part of the if, the true part of the if. And both of us get to do what? Money, 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 money. Right? We both take $75 out. Both of us correctly update this balance, and the balance will be negative. Even though this is supposed to prevent the balance from ever being negative, the balance will be negative after relative to that. And then we quick run, to, run our way to how this go and never see them from again. So in most languages, this is a problem. In almost every computer language, this is a problem, except in Scratch. Scratch will prevent this from being a problem. So I even have Marshall McLuhan right here. Here is an example of this at the top is saying withdraw. Okay? When, and so, this, so I have one spread at the top that says when green starts, set balance to 500. Broadcast withdraw and wait. Say balance. When I receive withdraw, withdraw 300. When I see withdraw, withdraw 400. So it's two, a three and a four, but it's only five. So this kind of makes it easy. So in theory, if this doesn't work, I should be able to take $700 out of a $500 bank account. Ready? Go. 200 because he's saying the balance. One of these guys got there first. The buffalo got there first. He says, yep, I got my money out, the 300. The star didn't get there. Even though in theory this happened, right? They both happened at the same time, right? You both saw that each of those sprites said, when I receive go, when I receive the withdraw, go. In theory, they should have happened at the same time, but it doesn't. Scratch prevents it from both happening at the same time. See that? So that's kind of cool. It means you don't have to worry about that problem. I feel good about that. You saw this picture after Luke showed it to you. This is called deadlock. I don't think he actually used the word deadlock, but that's deadlock. And deadlock is the idea that. You have a contention for resources. They each want to be able to get through, and I grab some, and you grab some, and now we can't move at all. I was going to have this demo where Dan and Luke do this demo where you ever pass somebody in the hall, and you say, oh, sorry, and you both step to the left, and you both, I'm sorry again, and you both step to the right? You can imagine a computer simulation that the two robots, that just does this forever. Just keep moving back and forth. They never progress. They never pass each other, but it's not frozen. There's still movement. That's what live lock is called. It means things change, but you're never getting any closer to the solution, which is like, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You kind of do this like little boogie on the side. In summary, with one minute to go, perfectly timed lecture. I'm very pleased. This sea change in computing is fundamental. It is upon us. It happened about 2005, and the world is different. Every laptop and desktop and server machine from now on, unless, unless I tell you differently, is multi-core. We're not going back. It's really exciting. It's hard. It's really, it's scary too. Why is it scary? Because there's about a billion computing professionals out there writing software, and they don't necessarily know how to write parallel programs without introducing these concurrency bugs, like deadlock, like live lock, like, which one? Race conditions. Okay? Those things are hard to avoid, and it is hard programming now. So if I said to everyone in the world, hey, you're a program, professional programmer, go be parallel, they wouldn't know how to do it. You need tutoring in to do that. So we as a community need to very quickly get on the stick to share the world of how to do successful pra best practices of how to do parallel programming. OK? Thanks, folks. We'll see you in lab. Hope you have a great lab. Get some air. It is way too hot. And there's a great talk right now if you want to follow me. 
into the, or just walk, go beat me in 